I assume we're recording. Okay, All right. excellent. Well, everybody, welcome to a uh, virtual mastermind group with Real Leadership Company, and we're so excited you guys are here to join us. We're going to be taking a look over the next three weeks at chapters from John Maxwell's book, Put Your Dream to the Test. And, uh, you know, we scheduled this uh, before all of this uh, coronavirus stuff even hit, and I think for a lot of people, this is going to become uh, more and more relevant um, over the next couple of weeks as we see how this all unfolds. So just a couple of rules um, when we're doing virtual chats, obviously we just ask people to be engaged. Um, we encourage you guys to participate with conversation as we work through the participants guides. We're gonna be starting uh, with chapter one uh, this week. And so in your participants guide, I'm gonna go there real quick and I'll tell you exactly where that's at. Um, we're gonna be starting um, with chapter one, which in your participants guide, that is on page seven. So we're gonna start at page seven, the ownership question. And we're gonna to attempt today to go not only through chapter one, but potentially even chapter two, depending on how the conversation goes. Um, we would encourage you guys to read the book, uh, Put Your Dream to the Test. You can get it on Amazon Kindle for $5.99. Uh, so we encourage you guys to grab that book and read it. Uh, but of course, even if you don't get a chance to read it, we can still work through this and talk about dreaming. And so you're more than welcome to drink, to eat uh, while we're doing this. Uh, you may want to lay off the alcoholic beverages this early in the morning. I know we're all home, but uh, enjoy a Diet Coke or a coffee, a donut, whatever it is you want to do. But we just want to be here to encourage each other to talk through dreams and to kind of go through, um, to kind of go through the steps uh, of the participants guide. So with that, uh, Tom, I know we always like to start off with an attitude of gratitude, and maybe we can even open it up between you and me and anybody else who wants to share, but it's really important in these moments of uncertainty and tough times for our country and really the world that we stay focused on what's important and what's, uh, what's valuable. So Tom, why don't you kick us off with that? Absolutely. I, I have to say that, um, <clears throat> I, I, man, I'm just so overwhelmed with, with things to be thankful for. I was just thinking the other day of, of just the basic stuff like uh, our face, uh, in uh, the nose and the mouth and the ears and eyes and all that stuff, the things that I can't touch right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm just so thankful to be able to smell and, and taste and hear uh, some of those basic functions that we take for granted a lot. Um, and so that's my thing. That's awesome, man. I know I am incredibly thankful uh, uh, for my amazing uh, caregivers. I own a uh, home care company and I have uh, close to 200 employees that are continuing to go out there and practice personal protection practices of washing hands and wearing gloves. And uh, we take care of about 170 seniors in Southeast Oakland County of the, some of the most vulnerable people in the community. And they are continuing to do an amazing job. Um, we're not seeing a lot of call offs. We're seeing people uh, from putting clients before family. It's just unbelievable. And uh, really not just for my caregivers, but for the nurses and doctors and uh, gosh, for grocery store workers and gasoline clerks and all these people that have to continue to show up to work so that we can have a semi-normal existence during this. I am so thankful for all of them. So that's a good thing. Does anybody else want to share? I think there's a way to, you can raise your hand or type it in or we'll call on you. Um, but we'd like to hear, what are you thankful for today? I've just unmuted everyone. So anybody got something to share? I am thankful for my friends that keep me grounded when I kind of go off the deep end on some things and they bring me back either through Facebook posts or text or it's, it's just, it's good. I mean, it's, we all have our funny little memes we put up, but this is serious stuff now. Yeah. And uh, we really got to buckle down here. Without a doubt. You're absolutely right, Keith. Anybody else? Okay. Well, that's okay. We just know we're going to start off every meeting this way for the next three Saturdays. And hey, just to, in case you need it, I just uploaded the document under the chat section, and that is the Mastermind Participants Guide. So if you haven't received it, if you don't have it, you can now click on that in the, uh, in the comment section. You can download that to your computer so you can follow along. So I'm happy we're able to get that done. Okay. Yeah, so I think Linda is starting, trying to talk. Hello, Linda. Uh, I think she's trying Hello to there, talk. Tom. There you are. There good you morning, are. Linda. Hey, good morning. How are you guys doing? 
We're great. Hey, we just did a moment uh, called Attitude of Gratitude, sharing what we're thankful for. What are you thankful for today, Linda? Oh, Christ and his word. What would we do without it? There you go. That's awesome. Absolutely. Very cool. I mean, that's the answer to everything, right? Absolutely. It's great. Okay, guys, we're going to get started then. We're, we're going to dive in. Again, if you're on page uh, seven of your participant's guide, and again, if you need it, we just uploaded it. We're going to talk about dreams today, and we're going to start off with the first chapter, which is the ownership question. And again, if you didn't get a chance to read it, it's okay. We might be sharing some stories today with you that are in the book, um, but you don't have to have read it to kind of get the grasp of it. Um, I absolutely love that in chapter one of John Maxwell's book, um, he, he tells a story about Arnold Schwarzenegger and how when Arnold was a 14-year-old boy, uh, he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. He, he couldn't figure out what was going to be his purpose. And so one day he ends up going to the gym at the age of 14. And he said, for whatever reason, he just saw these huge, gigantic, muscular, bodybuilding men. And he said, man, that is something that I could get behind, that I, that I could do. And so he started to work out six hours a day, six days a week. And we all pretty much know his story, right? Arnold became one of the most uh, prolific bodybuilders ever. He won Mr. Olympia and Mr. World seven times. Um, but there was more to it. He said, man, what else can I do with this now that I'm, uh, I've reached the epiphany or the top of this profession? Well, then he started to get into movies and he started making television programs. And next thing you know, this guy gets up to uh, a value, a worth of one point. Oops. Just from bodybuilding and just from uh, his ability to be able to do that. But then he said, I want to be able to do more. I want to give back. And what does he do? This, uh, this bodybuilder runs for governor in the state of California and he wins. And so this man was able to accomplish so much because he continued to not just have one dream, but he had multiple dreams and continued to follow them throughout his entire life. But what we have, what we learned from John in chapter one is this, that a dream is possible only if you own it. You have to own your dream. Nobody else can own it for you. No one else can make you do it yourself. And when you reflect on your current vocation, what are the signs that you are living your dream or maybe it's someone else's dream, right? So we say, I have a dream, but... And Henry uh, David Thoreau says, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. But we want to go through the, the excuses that John Maxwell lays out in chapter one of his book that talks about these are the excuses that we all make uh, for the dreams that we don't pursue. Excuse number one, dreams don't come true for ordinary people. Dreams don't come true for ordinary people. Which leads us to the question, how can a dream be both a target and a catalyst? Well, I, I want to dare to say this. Arnold Schwarzenegger at the age of 14 was probably an ordinary person. Like Arnold wasn't born muscular, right? Like he didn't come out and be like, I am here to conquer the world. That's not what Arnold Schwarzenegger did. He was born a child with dreams and aspirations of his own, but he wasn't born a bodybuilder. He wasn't born a movie star, and he certainly wasn't born a governor. At some point in Arnold's mind, his thoughts and beliefs began to change so that his actions would drive him to the results he wanted to make. Ordinary people accomplish amazing things every single day, but there's something that's different about these ordinary people when they make that transition from just doing the mundane to making something amazing and drastic. Tom, do you want to add anything on excuse number one? Yeah. So, you know, asking that question, a dream is only possible if you own it. Mm. And so many times uh, we find that we're living somebody else's dream. Yeah. Uh, where we're going to someone, uh, we're going to school to, to be uh, a lawyer or a doctor, or a teacher, or this, that, or the other. And it's just something maybe our parents have cast on us or, or uh, you know, just because of hard times, we need to get a job and, and we're in the job that we're in. But, um, and then sometimes we just lose sight of our dream. And, and so it's, we've, we've got to find a way to uh, dream again. 
Hmm. Right. And that's why we're all here. That's right. That's really important. I mean, how many times uh, you may be sitting to yourself thinking, man, oh man, how did I end up in the job that I'm in? <laughs> like, how did I end up here? But what, what caused me to go down this path and this route to pursue this dream or this career? Tom, you know, you talked about sometimes our parents have a, have a huge influence on us. Can you talk a little bit about the influence that your parents had on you in the profession that you're currently in right now? Well, <laughs> so, um, you know, my parents didn't cast on me uh, the uh, image of, of being a pastor, uh, even though that's what I am, and that's what my dad was. Um, uh, they, they didn't say, well, you need to be this. You need to go to ministry school to become this. It was just a matter of, um, you know, they, they set an example before me. And, and uh, it, well, t you know, because of being a person of faith, the Bible says that uh, your gifts will make room for you. And so I automatically had gifts uh, and abilities uh, that just, as I kept moving forward, the doors open. And uh, I've been at my current church in, um, <laughs> you know, for 19 years now. Um, so I, I know I'm called to do what I do. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm thankful for uh, the role model in my parents uh, growing up. Um, so, you know, there's that. And, and then there's another side of the coin, Bert, if I can in, interject this, is that uh, the movie... I can only imagine if anybody's ever seen it, you know what I'm talking about, where uh, Bart Millard's character there uh, from Mercy Me, uh, he's sharing his dreams with his father and his father dashes all of his dreams. And still yet he persevered to become, uh, you know, a very successful uh, musical artist. Absolutely. Anybody else want to share how maybe the, the way you were brought up or raised or what your parents and the influence they had? Is anyone following in their parents' footsteps or doing something specifically that their parents kind of wanted you to do or kind of forced you to do? Well, I uh, got into law enforcement. I was talking at first here. <laughs> you may have to mute uh, Michael's mic, Tom. Go ahead, David. Okay, I, I ended up getting into law enforcement largely because uh, I was seeking the approval of my father who was also in law enforcement. Mm. And uh, my parents were divorced when I was young, so I didn't have him in my life uh, a lot as an influence. And when I discovered that, uh, you know, I did have an interest in it, but that got him excited about about, you know, at the same time and so I think I largely went into that field uh, to please my dad, to, to gain his approval. And wow. I, I've done quite well. I'm actually a chief of police currently, but I often sit and wonder what would I have done if I hadn't needed my dad's approval and had just reached for whatever it was I really wanted to do. Uh, and and honestly, that's why I'm here. I'm I'm trying to, I'm trying to dream a different dream, uh, and and do something different. That's great. awesome, man. That's great, man. Anybody else want to share? I clearly, um, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Dave. Okay. I clearly um, started working at General Motors um, because of my dad's influence. Um, he actually set up some interviews at the plant and encouraged me to go to GMI. Um, and so, I, and so that some of it, I think was, I went to it because it was easy. You know, I, I knew GM, I worked, lived in the short area my whole time and GM was a big employer. Um, so it was, a, saw it as a good opportunity. Uh, but I also think pleasing my father was a, a big part of it. Um, I'm also in finance and my mom was an accountant for Sears for years. So their influence was clearly in my job choices. And um, like David said, uh, I, I'm looking for new dreams. I'm looking for some, I'm looking back and now I'm thinking if I had done some things differently, um, mm. there's some jobs I might've gotten into or, but I never really looked when I was 18. I just mm. went straight out of high school into GMI and just did what was uh, I think convenient at the time. Right. 
Okay, that's great. Anybody else want to share? Thanks for sharing, Dave. I think one thing's true. Um, and again, if anybody wants to jump in, you're welcome to. But it, one thing that's true is that oftentimes as children, we become the products of our parents or the lack of parents or the lack of culture, right? And if we don't have parents as children, we're always trying to model behaviors, right? So for example, growing up, you know, my parents were divorced. And so I was bounced back and forth between two families and there wasn't a lot of stability for me. So my one grandfather uh, who would always walk around with a video camera and he was always recording family functions and doing commentary on them. Uh, I took up to a liking of that. And I remember my grandfather at a young age would say to me, you know, Bert, one day you can be an announcer, you know, for the Cleveland Browns, or one day you could, you could be a disc jockey on the radio and I'm going to listen to you. And looking back now, uh, aside from my father, my stepfather, my mom and stepmother, my grandfather had a huge influence on my life because I ended up going to college for communication arts. I ended up becoming a disc jockey. I ended up doing play-by-play -play radio for the college basketball team and football teams. And even though I'm not doing professional media anymore today, I think the desire that both David and Dave and even Tom alluded to a little bit is we desire to uh, appease and get approval from the people who are around us that, that are our role models, right? But there becomes a transition point in our lives where we become the role model. And so we just need to be careful for in two things. One, that we're not just pushing down our dreams or our missed opportunities on other people in the next generation to give them a chance to be what they want to potentially become or speak life to them. But also now at this point to start saying, hey, am I really doing what I want to be doing? Is it worth doing? And that's one thing John Maxwell talks about in chapter one. He says, and I don't have the direct quote in front of me, but a lot of times when people go through a midlife crisis, uh, it's not because they have lost the ability to dream. It's that they, they realize that they're living out someone else's dream and not their own. Does that make sense? And so what, whatever you're doing right now, man, if you're a chief of police or you're working finance at GM or, or whatever it is you're doing, you're a business owner, it doesn't mean that what you do doesn't have value, doesn't have worth. But we all as humans have this, this innate desire to become what we believe our full potential could be. And oftentimes the second excuse that we make is that if the dream isn't big enough, it's not worth pursuing. If the dream isn't big enough, it's not worth pursuing. And in the book, Maxwell says, a dream doesn't have to be big. It just has to be bigger than you. So right now, if you're in a, in a job or you're stuck in a situation um, where you desire something to be a little bit better than what it is right now, you may just need to step up to the next level, level up, so to speak, in what you think that dream can be. And ask the question, how could living your dream make you bigger? Not necessarily the dream is bigger and you have to move up into it, but how can the dream make you bigger? And Tom, you talked about this on Wednesday a little bit when we did our, our first, uh, our first uh, discussion session that we have to grow into our dreams, right? Mm -hmm. Dreams should call us to become bigger or better or to seek out new uh, routes of doing things. Tom, do you have any feedback on this excuse you want to share with us? Well, yeah. So, you know, a lot of times we think because the, the dream isn't grand, and, and I often ask this question to the students that I teach. I ask this question. I said, if you had all the resources in the world, what one thing would you do? And this is a question for even all of us listening. If you had all the resources at your disposal, what one thing would you do? And, and too often people will say, well, uh, you know, I would feed the homeless or, or uh, you know, I would create a homeless shelter or, you know, anything along those lines. Right. But what's funny about those quick responses, because they didn't take time to think about it, was they could be doing that right now. Right. Right. They could pack a lunch and, and take it down to the street corner. And there's someone down there that could use a lunch. So. Uh, you know, a lot of times because we think that it's not big, according to the question here or the excuse, that it's not worth pursuing, right? But we've got to start wherever we are. Um, on our podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, by the way, you can hear more of the podcast. You can go to our uh, 
website, realleadershipcompany.com. But I was interviewing a Latana, and she was saying that she actually had a dream during the middle of the night. And she dreamed about writing a book and making a, a play, a stage play, and, and, and so many other things. And so she started out the next morning. She, she contacted her uh, relative who had already written a book, and he gave her some information. She wrote a book, submitted the proposal. Well, guess what? As of today, right now, today, she's releasing her third book. Okay, so uh, it, it all we have to do is just begin to see that dream and begin to put one foot in front of the other and throw out the excuses. That's right. That's good. So let's let's break that question down that Tom just asked and pose it to everybody. Um, if you could, if you could do anything, if resources were not limiting to you, if you could do anything right now, what would you do? What would you do? So we'll just take a second, let you guys mull that over, and there might be some silence here, but tell us, if you could do anything in the world right now and resources were not an issue, what would you be doing? You know, uh, last night I was talking to some folks and and uh, they're saying, well, you know, I, my dream, it, that can't work. It can't work because, you know, that was something I dreamed when I was a kid. I can't see that working for me now. But uh, I shared that John Maxwell's dad made this statement. He's 92, I think. He's 92 years old. And he made the statement, um, uh, my best days are ahead of me. <laughs> At 92, he says, my best days are ahead of me. Well, that inspired, that inspired this other woman who's 91. And she says, you know, my whole life or most of my life, I've been living for my husband. And he's gone now. And so what am I going to do? And so she sat down and began to write a book at age 91 and begin selling those books at church, uh, some 40 or, or you know, 50 books that she sold at one service. Uh, so uh, we can start wherever. We've just got to be willing to, you know, take a chance on that dream. Yeah. The, uh, so I'm, I'm going to keep it open still. Does somebody else want to share? Uh, what would you be doing? If resources were not an issue, what would you be doing? I don't know what I would do with that bird. I mean, I, for me to even conceptualize that, I, I don't even know where to begin. But like this 91 year old lady, every day on my job, I feel like I'm just starting. There's so much more to do. And it's, it's always, I, it doesn't feel like I've been doing the same thing for 40 years. I just, I, every day is a new day. But for me to, to imagine what would I do if I had every resource, I don't even know how to start with that. And Keith, why do you think that is? I don't know. I know that's an easy answer out, but I, I honestly don't know why I don't think that way. Well, luckily for you, uh, we don't accept easy way outs. So <laughs> we're going to get to think about that for the next three weeks, sir, brother. Yeah, because uh, <clears throat> you're right. It, 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 is, it is the easy way out is to just say, look, I'm a business owner and this is what I'm doing. Keith, let me ask you another question to, to just – try to help you process through this. Why did you go into the business that you're in right now? Because I saw a need for it back in the eighties. Okay. While I was in the air force, I knew this was coming up. I knew this was going to be a hot technology um, communications. Everybody is always going to need it. Okay. So you're telling me that back in the eighties, you sat down one day or whatever. And you said, man, uh, the, and just why don't you tell everybody what you do? That way, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm doing it justice. So tell everybody what the, you do for your business. I'm the owner of a phone company, which we more or less morphed into a VoIP slash IT company. Okay. But when I started, it was it was back in the in the 
late seventies when I started getting into this business. So you were delivering rotary phones is what you're saying back then. Pretty much. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So back in the day, up kind. That's, <laughs> <laughs> not quite Tom. <laughs> to join the party line, please. No. Okay. So, so back in the, you're telling me you, you get out of the air force and your dream back then was, man, your dream was I need to sell telephones. That was your dream. Yeah. No, it wasn't. Why did you go into this business, Keith? To be rich. To be rich. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere, right? You came out of the Air Force and you said, man, I want to be able to make money, right? Yes. Why did you say that? Why was that so important to you? Because I was 22 years old and I thought, man, if I get this thing done, I can be retired when I'm 30. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That was 30 some years ago. I understand. No, I totally get that. That's good. Okay. So you, you, so your dream was to find a business model that you could make money at to generate wealth, right? Yes. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that dream. If that was your dream back then, that's okay. You're doing it. But how has that dream changed? Are you still trying to generate wealth or are you trying to do something with the wealth? I think I have morphed into a comfort zone and this hit me as you guys were talking earlier. It's like, I'm in a comfort zone and I, I am all about you in your comfort zone. You're going to die. Mm. And I just realized I, I I'm there. So what's going to motivate me to get out of it? Money. I don't think so. I don't think it's money. Okay. So we need to work on the dream then. Cause what, what happens, what happens after retirement, Keith? I, I don't know. Okay. That's okay. This is why we're, this is why we do this, this is why we do what we do. Cause you're right. One day you're going to have to retire. Right. Yeah. A perfect example. My, my father, um, an amazing man, one of the hardest working men I, I know and his whole entire life, he's had this entrepreneur spirit, but he's always had to work for other people, right? Because he's had to work multiple jobs. He's always just tried to make ends meet to make sure that his kids never went without. Well, he launched off about 15 years ago uh, to start his own business. And now he, and my, I'm a junior, so his name is Bert Senior, obviously, but he owns Bert's Handyman Service in Erie, Pennsylvania. And for the last 12, 13 years, he's been his own boss, doing this entrepreneurial stuff, doing handyman services, which is a huge industry. Um, but here's the deal. My, my dad is, he's going to be turning 64 this year and he's got a bad shoulder and he's got a bad knee and it's getting more and more difficult to do this type of work. And so when I talk to him, I don't just come straight out and, you know, drill him with it because he is my dad. But I do ask these questions. I say, dad, what happens at 65? <laughs> You know, what are you going to do for your business for the legacy? I mean, you know, it's a handyman business. You can't just sell a handyman business. I mean, it's not like there's any assets except for your van and your, your equipment. What's going to happen next? And the challenge with a lot of small business owners and let's be honest, pastors and people who work in the community is there's not a lot of afterthought given to what comes next because we're so busy in the here and now in the present that we do get into a comfort zone. And if we, and if we don't take the time to dream and we keep making excuses for why we can't do it, when retirement does show up, we freak out like, I didn't want this. Or, or, or now maybe you're retired and you have a spouse and your spouse has a dream and now you just got done living out someone else's dream your entire, your entire career. And now because you and your spouse haven't been communicating about dreams and sharing dreams together, now the other spouse is forced to live with you and your dream or vice versa. And they're still miserable. I'm retired and I'm still not doing what I want to be doing. And that's why these conversations are so incredibly important. The third excuse that John Maxwell gives in chapter one says, now is not the time to pursue my dream. Now is not the time to pursue my dream." which then begs the question, when do you think the timing would be right for you? And I'm going to pose something out there right now. As we are all quarantined, self-quarantined right now for the next two to however many weeks it's going to be. And I know some of us still have to go to work. If you're an essential employee, we get that. We know that's still happening, right? But you can definitely tell that there's a calming out there right now, right? There is. 
Um, even at my job, even though we're incredibly busy and it's stressful, I'm noticing that a lot of the high pressure stuff that I deal with on a daily basis is calming down right now because, because what's happening, we're dealing with less people, right? And there's less voices that are influencing us. The time is right now, maybe not to pursue your dream, but to at least have a conversation about your dream, which is what you're all doing here today. You know, we always say this in real leadership, right? That thoughts and beliefs drive actions, and actions drive results, right? If you're not getting the results that you desire, you have to change your actions. But the problem with actions is unless you believe and think differently, your actions will never change. Think about someone who goes on to a diet, right? I think everybody in the world says, man, I'd like to lose a couple of pounds. Those are the results, right? We all want that. And so our actions are what? We get really motivated. We sign up for Weight Watchers. Um, we, we do something, uh, some diet plan because a friend told us about it. We start drinking prune juice and eating cabbage soup and all these different things. We take all these different actions, right? Because we believe it's going to get us the results we want. But here's the deal. If your thoughts and beliefs don't change about dieting and eating healthy, you may lose a couple pounds, but you're going to gain it all back when you're done because you still haven't changed the way you think or believe about something. Thoughts and beliefs drive actions. Actions drive results. And unless you change the way you think and believe about something, your actions will not take hold and the results are never going to be what you want it to be. How many people have said, I want to get healthy? And they go out and they buy an exercise bike and they get the equipment. Guys, I have a treadmill and an elliptical in my basement. Bought it years ago, right? <laughs> and my desire was, man, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to use this equipment, man. I'm going to get on it. I put a TV in front of it. Like I, I created the perfect environment for me to lose weight. And guess what? If you don't get on the elliptical and the treadmill, it's just a piece of furniture, right? Right. Thoughts and beliefs haven't changed. So if you have dreams about what you want to do in the future, you have desired results, but you don't change the way you think and believe you're thinking, man, I'm in my comfort zone. I have to keep doing my job. I want to encourage you guys. The time is right now to think about and pursue your dreams, to start writing it down. Because if you start to write down your dreams and you start to take time to ponder on those dreams and think about those dreams and then share with a group of guys and girls like we're doing today about, man, what do you think about this? And people can build you up and encourage you. And they ask you difficult questions like I did a little bit with Keith there a little bit, right? The way you change your thoughts and beliefs is by having your thoughts and beliefs challenged, yeah. which now gets you to think about them in a different light, which then allows you to change your thoughts and beliefs to alter the actions you're taking, which then can produce the results you want. That's the secret right there, right? I know Tom and I are both Christians, right? We're both believers. So there's a scripture in the word that says, allow uh, the process of faith to happen by the renewing of your mind, Right? It doesn't say change the way you do things. It doesn't say hope for different results. It says this happens through the renewing of your mind. That's what has to happen when it comes to chasing your dreams and chasing after what you want to do. So of those three excuses we just talked about, excuse number one, again, is dreams don't come true for ordinary people. We know that's not true, but yet we still think it. <laughs> we say if the dream isn't big enough, it's not worth pursuing. We said that's not true. And then we said, now is not the time to pursue my dream. All of those things are not true. In the next three weeks, I want, mark my word, check this out. Over the next three weeks, you are going to see creativity on a level in this country that we have not seen in decades. You are going to see companies that produced one thing now retool and start producing another thing. You're going to see new business enterprises rise up in this country at a rate that we haven't seen in years because now people are going to start thinking about how can I make hand sanitizer? How can I make masks and face masks? How am I able to be ready for the next pandemic that comes down? What type of business model can I do or choose to make it happen? Keith, you know, I, for example, the phone systems at my work are not VoIP right now. And we started the process getting ready to go to VoIP three months ago. But before we did that, we had to get fiber brought into our office. Had I been a month sooner on this, 
all of my employees could be sitting at home right now with a VoIP phone and the, and the calls could be transferred directly to them at home and it would make the process of working at home so much easier than it is today. You're going to see businesses totally change the way they do business. You're going to see more churches doing podcasts and broadcast online. You're going to see restaurants that weren't doing to go and delivery ramp that up. You're going to see industries totally change right now. Because what happens <laughs> when we go through difficult times? People get creative. Yeah, yeah. Success does not breed creativity. It doesn't. When you're successful, you get in the comfort zone. And you just keep doing the same thing you've always done. Why? Because success keeps us in comfort. But man, when you go through hard times, when you have to start pushing in and dreaming differently, when you need to start pushing through and finding solutions to things, it's amazing how creative people get. So mark my word, our country is going to be changed after this for the better because you're going to see new industry pop up. You're going to see the way uh, uh, different public services are working. You're, I bet you you're going to find, you know, the public works department is complaining now because everyone's flushing Lysol wipes down the toilet. Well, I could have told you three years ago in my industry, that's a horrible idea. I bet you you're going to see Lysol or one of these companies come up with a biodegradable wipe that can be used because they're going to have to do that to save sewer systems. You watch the change that's about to happen because people are going to start dreaming over these three weeks in ways they haven't in years um, because we haven't needed to do that. So that's what I want to encourage you guys to do. Stop making excuses and start finding reasons to dream right now because you have all the time in the world right now to do it. Sound good? That's Very good. excellent. Awesome. Tom, why don't you go into the next section on how to take ownership of your dream? All right. Well, that, that's awesome, Bert. Thank you. Um, so the, the next question here, number one, of how to take ownership of your dream is be willing to bet on yourself. Be willing to bet on yourself. If you're not willing to bet on yourself, how do you think that someone else is going to be willing to bet on you? Right? Uh, is, anybody watch the, the television show Shark Tank, right? And, yeah. and you see folks uh, walk in through the door and, and you see those that have not invested hardly anything in their business, but yet they want this millionaire to invest into their business and uh, it doesn't always work out but then there's those that gave their blood sweat and tears for this thing and unless mr wonderful tells them that they need to kiss it goodbye and give it a good funeral um they're willing to invest into this thing because they see that uh, not only is there a money maker but the person driving this machine um is motivated right so you got to be willing to bet on yourself. Listen to this. You may succeed if nobody else believes in you, but you will never succeed if you don't believe in yourself. And uh, too often, we don't believe in ourselves. Self-belief is so important. Um, getting back to the questions asked previously, you know, are you living your dream or somebody else's? You know, if we are not believing in ourselves, it may be because we're trying to meet up with the status quo of somebody else, right? And, and so we don't feel sure of ourselves. When I began preaching, um, I thought I had to preach like my dad. Now, my dad was, was a hollerer and a shouter and, a, you know, fire and, you know, and that just wasn't me. And so whenever I tried to bring that uh, to the table, I just felt awkward and like a fish out of water. But when I finally came into my own, doing basically what I'm doing right now and, and sharing and, and just in a relational uh, kind of atmosphere, uh, I just kind of set right into my, my niche. And so we got to be willing to believe in ourselves because we're worth something. We're valuable. You're as, as unique as a snowflake. Every one of us have uh, a, a fingerprint that is unlike anybody else's. So you are unique. You have something to bring to the table that nobody else has. And it's your uniqueness that makes you special. And we all have that. But sometimes we degrade it because at, nobody needs what I got. Right? For me, I'm, I'm very... Um, uh, I can troubleshoot things and, and figure things out really quickly. I can play music and I can record and write music and I can do all those things, but 
uh, sometimes I feel, well, I'm not as good as so-and-so. And because of that, I devalue myself and devalue what I can do and devalue the fact that I can make a difference in a lot of people's lives, right? But because I think, again, back to that other question, that, that the dream has to be, um, the, the, the dream is not big enough, right, to mean anything. And so when we get to think about where we're at and what we can do, and that's, that's the idea today, we need to do what we can do. What can you do today uh, to make today matter? Isn't that good? Any questions on that? Okay, so here's one of the questions here. Do you believe someone is willing to bet on you? Do any of you have someone that's willing to bet on you? Besides my wife and kids. That's a good start. <laughs> we don't have a choice. <laughs> That's a great start right there. Uh, so, all right, here's the other million dollar question. Are you willing to bet on yourself? Right, are we willing to take that gamble and bet on ourselves? Right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, again, that's the million dollar question. Are we willing to that on ourselves? And if so, because it, we might be jumping the gun right now asking this question or, or making the statement that our dreams are going to cost us, right? And, and a lot of us, you know, I was talking to a gentleman the other day and, and he's talking about all these things that he wants to have happen in his life, but I know that he's not going to see those things happen because of where he's at in his life. He's stuck, but he thinks that uh, a rich lost uncle is going to, to die and leave him a, an inheritance of a bazillion dollars and it's going to take away all of his troubles and he's going to be, you know, riding high. But that's not the reality. The reality is we have to do something where we're at. We have to, you know, again, the Bible says faith without works is dead. So we got to make those steps. We got to start taking one foot in front of the other to see where it leads. And just like I, I mentioned Latana just a moment ago in the podcast, uh, she just began to put one foot in front of the other. And by the way, she's not only released her third book today, she's also uh, done the stage play. And she's done all the things that she's seen in her, in her dream. So, uh, and it all took she didn't know anything or know anybody. It's just one step in front of the other, right? So are you willing to bet on yourself? That's very important. And uh, let's see. Uh, number two, let's go to number two. Number two is lead your life instead of just accepting your life. Lead your life instead of just accepting your life. If I can speak to the leaders in the room at the moment and say that if you're not willing to lead yourself, how can you expect others to follow you? Right? We've got to be willing to, to lead ourselves. We've got to be willing to take the initiative to, to, to jump out of our comfort zone. Uh, as Bert said, right now, we're seeing all kinds of stuff happening uh, in the industries around us, uh, especially the restaurant business because they've got to figure out a way to do something. Um, I have a musician friend that, that plays in restaurants. Well, guess what? He's out of work. But I challenged him, maybe, I don't know, do a Facebook Live and, and provide dinner music for people, live dinner music that people can listen to while they're sitting, eating dinner with their family at home uh, for donations. Uh, you know, to do something, but this is, as Bert said, this is going to cause us to step out of our comfort zone and try something we've never tried before. Um, and, and here's the thing too, think about this. Um, if you felt like you've wanted to be a manager your whole life, uh, but you're not in that role yet, uh, part of the reason is, is because we're not assuming that role, right? We're not putting ourselves in position. I, I've made the statement before, but uh, John Maxwell says, uh, people come up to him all the time and say, hey, hey John, how do, you, how do I write a book? And John says, well, you start writing, right? But we think that we have to do all these other things 
but we, but the reality is we got to start with the basics. We've got to just start writing, right? Do you have a book? Do you have some information? Um, so we've got to assume the position, right? We may not be the leader of our company, but what if we were to assume that position in our daily lifestyle? Uh, you know, getting, learning more information, going to school, whatever the case may be, because like today, like right now with all this going on in our world, opportunity has struck. And are we available? Are we in the position to, uh, to step into the opportunity? Because once the opportunity is here, if we're not prepared, it's gone. Any comments on all that? Okay, so listen to this on, on number two there. It says, am I willing to assume responsibility for my dream? If so, what things can I do that would help me develop my God-given potential? At the top of this thing, uh, I, I shared that, uh, that the Bible said that your gifts make room for you. Well, I, I'm, I'm a talented musician. Uh, and I'm not saying that bragging, but I, I can hear music and I can just play it. Uh, that's the way I'm, I'm made up, the way I'm wired. And, and so I have not put that in the corner, even when people thought in the early years that it was just a fad or a phase that would you know, go away, or maybe there's no money in, in it or whatever the case may be. And <laughs> there's not always a lot of money in it, but, but I'm doing what I was gifted to do. And some of you are gifted to do some things that you're not doing because it wasn't popular or whatever the case may be, or it wasn't approved of by our parents or by our, our friends or whatever the case may be. But what do you feel that is your God-given potential? Anybody have something on that? Uh, David. There we go. I couldn't unmute for some reason. Uh, appreciate the help there. Um, yeah, actually, I've uh, been learning that I am a little bit adept at, uh, at uh, counseling. I actually attended a uh, three-year pastoral counseling school, and uh, I would really like to use that uh, that ability. I'm also a Christian. I've been known to do a few uh, preaching and teaching things, and and I I really see God using me strongly in that way uh, from time to time. And I would really love to pursue that to have the the financial freedom to be able to pursue that and not have to worry about where my income's coming from. Mm, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's really good. That's really good. And, and you know, but uh, David, don't just, you know, sit back and, and wait to be um, <laughs> called in to be a pastor at a church, right? right. Uh, right. We've got to take the initiative where we're at, because there's plenty of street corners that, that we can, you know, get on our soapbox and preach, right? So there's a way to do it. There's a way to go about it. But, but again, going back to that previous first question that says that my my dream's not big enough mm. right and so we've we've got to uh, we, we've got to start where we're at right because there's a friend there's a a group of people uh e even you know probably your family members as we you know are being self-quarantined right now uh that you can share with that you can uh you know, open up the Bible and just begin to share something. Uh, and sure, you know what? Listen to this. I want everybody to hear this. Success is based on a lot of failures. Okay? Thomas Edison is the perfect example, right? Failure after failure, or he just said he figured out a thousand and one ways how not to make the light bulb. Right. right. So if we can learn to use our failure as a stepping stone and don't even call it failing. Yep. Right. Uh, John Maxwell wrote a book called failing forward. 
right? Use it to propel us, to cause us to work harder, to, to, to try something else. Now, we know the definition, the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results, but that's what we do every day. That's right. We hope that something different is going to happen. <laughs> We've got to take the initiative to change. I'm reading this book right now called um, uh, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits by James uh, Clear, I think. I'll get it for you. But anyway, it is fantastic in regards to thinking about uh, the habits. If we can just change our habits by 1%. It, it'll make a huge difference in a year's time. We all know that if a ship changes course of direction by one degree, it can end up hundreds of miles off course, right? So if we would to change our trajectory by 1%, we may be ending up someplace new, a new charted territory, new uncharted territory. Um, so we've gotta be willing to, to take that step of faith, if you will. Tom, I just want to comment too on, you know, the, the principle of lead your life instead of just accepting your life. And right now, <clears throat> right now, there are a lot of people who are just accepting what's happening to them. And even though I think that what our government is doing right now is, is absolutely necessary and it's, it's positive, right? We're talking about, you know, giving money to every American under $100,000. They need to do that to keep money flowing. And I get that, but there are going to be people who are going to see that, that gift of money as their savior, or this is it. I, okay, I don't have to work now because I have some money coming in, or I don't need to stretch myself because this is happening. Where right now, you're seeing, if you look around for it online, you can see amazing changes. Last night, I was, uh, yesterday, I was really frustrated coming home from work because we only have a limited number of masks for my caregivers to wear. And that's one of the biggest things that they can have to help protect them while they're in the home and protect my clients. If I can keep my caregivers safe uh, from spreading uh, COVID-19, then it may prevent my 170 plus clients from getting it, which allows them to stay home so we don't continue to flood the healthcare system. But I thought to myself, I'm almost out of masks. I need more masks. And so last night I came home and I've just been pondering and thinking about this. We talk about having dreams that are bigger than you, right? I, I, I'm not a mask manufacturer. I don't know how to find more masks. I own a durable medical equipment company. I can't order more masks. They're not available. So you have to get creative in these moments. And the so last night I'm sitting on the couch and I'm just thinking about this and meditating and pondering it and going over and over again in my head, what do I need to do? And I see a video on YouTube of how you can sew a mask. And I'm thinking, well, I don't own a sewing machine. I'm not good at sewing. <laughs> but then it occurred to me that there are potentially hundreds of thousands of people at home right now doing absolutely nothing that may have sewing machines and may have material and may be really good at this. And so I did one Facebook post last night and between last night and today, I have nearly 40 people now that are actively looking to sew me masks for my caregivers. That's great. And so, so that's what I want to stress is that either you lead your life or you accept it. I could have just sat back and said, well, this is, this is the hand that's been dealt to me. I can't do anything about this. There's no way I can overcome this. Or I can say, man, I can't make this happen on my own. Let me reach out to the amazing people that are around me to see what they can do. I have one girl right now, I just missed a phone call from her and I'll call her back in a minute, but uh, her name is Emily. Met her, I've never met the woman, but I know her now through Facebook. And she is literally driving around to the different uh, craft stores today to find the elastic banding that is needed uh, to make these masks. And she is committed. One person by herself is committed to making me 200 washable masks, wow. which oh, will give great. me enough for every one of my caregivers, plus some of my clients. Um, but I have more than that. So now all of a sudden you see there's dozens of people that want to do this. Now I'm going to be able to find places to donate these masks to nursing homes and assisted livings, but it's all because I didn't just sit at home last night and say, woe is me. Life is happening to me. What am I going to do? It's dreaming a little bit bigger than you and leading your life, not accepting your life, right? So I encourage you guys to do that. No matter what you're facing right now, right? no matter what industry you're in, if you're stuck at home, 
man, this is, a, let me tell you, I'm surprised there's not more cold calling happening right now. There's a lot of people sitting at home doing <laughs> nothing right now. Like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, hey, I mean, I, and again, I don't know what everybody's industry is right now, but, you know, what a great time to be cold calling and saying, hey, I just, I know you're going through a rough time right now. I know you're working from home. Did you have struggles this, this, yeah, this time around working from home with your business? Yes, I did. Well, listen, I do VoIP, right? And I can help you guys get through this the next time. Or, man, I mean, there's just so many things that we could be doing right now, plus improving ourselves, which is what you guys are all doing on a Saturday morning, which is awesome. But don't allow the next three weeks to just happen to you. Lead your life during this time. Don't just allow, it, don't just accept what's been handed to you. You can still do amazing things even while you're at home. So just wanted to share that. That's good stuff, Bert, thank you. Um, so here's a question for us. What decisions can I make that will move me towards my dream? What decision decisions can I make right. that will move me towards my dream? Anybody? Uh, David, uh, Russell, what about you? What, what can you do that will move you towards your dream? Well, what I, what I need to do and have been struggling to do is just to reserve some time either every day or, you know, set aside time on my calendar in some fashion that I devote to um, accomplishing my dream, you know, uh, instead of just doing the things that I always do, all my go-to habits, all my go-to things. Um, for whatever reason, that's been a struggle for me uh, to, just, to just set aside and devote time to what I, you know, to take the steps I know I need to take. So what's one step that you can take? Well, I, I am pursuing uh, a real estate investing business. And part of the reason I'm doing that is I, I, I have had an interest in that since I was in my 20s, but I never did anything with it. Um, I toyed with it a little bit, but I never actually pulled the trigger per se, never actually committed to do that. Okay. So I've been taking some classes and, and educating myself and, and uh, trying to put together a team of people to kind of help me uh, get things going. But uh, the hard part is, you know, committing to doing that every day, you know, or, or, or at least sufficiently that, that it gets some momentum going. Right. Well, let me share, let me share two things with you. One is if you can do one thing every day, all right. It may not seem like a lot, right? Um, going to the gym for five hours on one day is not going to do you any good. <laughs> but if you can spend 20 minutes every day throughout the year, it's going to make a big improvement. And another bonus here is uh, we're, we're joined on this conversation by a very successful uh, real estate guru here, uh, my my cousin Paula Johnson is on on the Got talk it, with us, and uh, and she is um, very much into real estate. Paula, do you got any any words of encouragement? Sure, for I was going to I was going to pipe in there, Dave. Um, what exactly are you thinking about getting your license, or are you thinking about buying houses and flipping them? Uh, either flipping, wholesaling, something along those lines uh, initially. Eventually, okay. I would like to to uh, to own and uh, you know to draw residual income as well. So you want to get not like rent, maybe rentals? Like, are you thinking like more like rentals? Down down the road, yes. Okay, flipping flipping is um, right now with the housing market being uh, at a low inventory is not a good time to buy um, unless you're looking for a rental property. Rental properties are really valid right now. But everything else it seems to be because the demand is so high. I've got people paying anywhere from five to ten thousand just to get the house. So as an investor, this is not the time to purchase. You kind of got to watch the stock market, when to buy, when to sell. Right. That's great. Gotcha. It's uh. But if you do want to have any conversation after this, I can I can assist you with things that I've learned with our rentals as well. Okay. That's, That's great. great. Awesome. Uh, Paula, would you mind uh, sharing your number in the chat section there? Um, yeah, I can, yeah. Awesome. 
does anybody else <clears throat> want to share a little bit maybe how they feel like you've been accepting your life and not leading it and just being a little bit vulnerable here a little bit and kind of what you've been going through? Because sometimes it's, it's difficult to change mindset unless you can acknowledge that you're in a mindset. Well, I have probably been accepting, I mean, yeah, just because things, I've been doing this for so long now, people just call because of referrals and stuff. So like I said, that accepting leads you into your comfort zone, which I'm, I'm not stagnant, but I'm certainly not progressing rapidly. Yeah, okay. Oops. Anybody else? As far as he was saying that he's progressing slowly, but don't you think there's life lessons learned so that you don't make mistakes? If you move too quickly, you can sink your ship too. True. And it's funny you bring that up because I've got like probably three or four other people I could move into this VoIP just because of what's going on now. And I'm holding off on it because we're going to do a pretty big job on the next week or so. And I don't want anything to mess with that job. Um, and my partner's saying, what are you scared of? I was like, well, I'm not scared of nothing, but I know how jobs go. You put a job in, you spend another week training. And if I get three other jobs going at the same time, so I guess I'm I don't know if I'm scared or what. I'm just holding off, holding back right now. What does your gut tell you? What does your, your, your wisdom tell you? My gut says, let's get Bert's job done and then move on to other people. <laughs> that might be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bert will appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but, you know, one thing, we talked about this on a, uh, you know, Tom, we talked about this on a podcast a couple weeks ago, uh, this concept of <clears throat> dream seeds. And I think this is really important in, in business and even in your own personal life is uh, we all, if you've ever, if anyone has ever done any type of gardening whatsoever, right? So what do you do? First, you envision a layout for your garden, right? And you say, okay, we, we're going to put tomatoes over here and cucumbers over here, and we're going to do this. And so you go out and you you till the soil, right? And you prepare the soil and you get it ready and, and, uh, and maybe you put down some weed block or whatever the case is and you get it all ready. And then you go to the store and you buy the seeds, right? And so you, you buy the heirloom tomato seed pack and you buy the cucumber and you buy all these packs of seeds, which is awesome, right? And then you take the seeds home and you put them on the counter and let's say maybe it rains and so you don't go out that day and then the next day you got to work and and pretty soon you you go a month or two into this and even though the ground is ready for it and even though you own the seeds there is no garden because the seeds have never been planted right, right. and so here's the deal dreams are the exact same way we all have these dream seeds we get this packet of dream seeds of what we want to accomplish or what we want to do in life and we and we we have these seeds and we pull them out and we look at them when it's not in season and we say oh man i i can't wait to i cannot wait to plant these seeds i can't wait to see what grows with it and then when it's actually time to plant we don't do it and so therefore we never see our dreams manifest themselves just like you would never see a vegetable garden grow if you don't take the time to plant the seeds and i think all of us have got these dream seed packets sitting around the house of dreams that we would like to do things we would like to try to accomplish but unless you start planting seeds you're never going to see it happen and so keith i would just i would encourage you like you just said is you know you don't want to mess up what's coming up next well luckily we know each other so you're not going to mess up our relationship but if you don't plant seeds they're not going to grow in the future right if, if you're not out networking and marketing and talking about what it is you can do or you're not speaking to a certain uh, event that's happening right now you're never going to see a harvest from it if you're not planting seeds and so i you know Another perfect example of this is just the way you, the way we change the way we think through thoughts and beliefs. And I just shared the story um, because again, I, I, it's motivated and I want you to get this. I've, I've, I've enjoyed hunting. I've taken up hunting the last couple of years and I've done some hog hunting and it's been a lot of fun. And every time, and I just think this way, whenever I'm in a situation in a business or whatever the case is, I'm always thinking to myself, 
how, how could I do this business myself or how could I do this better? Just the way my mind thinks. And so we're down hunting in Oklahoma and uh, the ranch is nice. It's a high fence ranch. You're chasing hogs throughout it, trying to do your hunting. And uh, you're staying in this lodge and it's not a very nice lodge, but we paid some good money to be down there. And so me and the other guys were joking saying, man, wouldn't it be cool to own our own ranch? Wouldn't it be cool to be able to, to go hunting whenever you want to and, and to sell hunts? And I'm thinking, I think, yeah, I think that would be an amazing thing. I would love to be able to do that. So a seed was planted. And then I came back up to Michigan and I thought, well, you really can't do hog farms up here in Michigan because they're not allowed to have feral. We don't want feral hogs in Michigan. They probably wouldn't last through the winter. So we just, just for the fun of it, in a moment of time, I have my dream board. I just wrote the word ranch on it. And so when I would sit there and have these times where I could ponder and think, I would think about the ranch and I would start to dream about a ranch. And then I'd start looking up ranches for sale online and just because you have to feed the dream right if you don't tend to a seed that's planted it's not going to grow properly and so sure enough we ended up finding this this ranch in in Rodney Michigan and I'm like wow this looks really cool this seems like it's too good to be true and and I said to myself well I know that I don't have enough of the financial resources to buy a ranch so what did I do? What we just talked about in the prior section, this, can someone else buy into your dream as well? So I went and talked to a buddy who owns another home care business. And I know he used to enjoy hunting and, and ranching. I said, I said, Seth, we need to go check out this ranch. And all of a sudden I planted a seed with Seth. He wasn't even thinking about ranches, but I planted a seed with him. And all of a sudden we end up going up and we look at this ranch together. We're blown away. We're like, this is so cool. We can't believe that, that we could potentially do this. And the long story short is this, we now own Full Rut Ranch in Rodney, Michigan, where we're going to be able to sell whitetail hunts and go on vacations and do seminars. But it all started because we planted a seed. Seed planting for dreams is so important, you guys. If there's something you want to do or accomplish or strive for, you got to plant a seed. And, like, and you may not have all the resources to do it. I didn't have all the resources to do it. But then you find someone else and you plant a seed with them. And now all of a sudden when two people are tending the same garden, you can really grow some dreams. So that's what I would encourage you guys to, today is as we continue to talk about leading your life instead of accepting it, man. How many of us just accept where we are as this is it. There's never going to be anything else than what we're doing right now. But if you want to achieve more and do more, if you can't do it on your own, find some other people to dream with you and plant seeds with them. Look at what you know, Tom and I are doing right now. You know, Tom came to me a year and a half ago and said, wouldn't it be awesome to be, become certified John Maxwell trainers? And I love John Maxwell's books. I just didn't know that you could become a certified trainer. Didn't, didn't even cross my mind. And so Tom had a dream and he planted the seed with me and now we're tending this dream together. And we ended up going to the John Maxwell training in Orlando last year. And here we are, you know, a small young leadership company that's, that's fledging and growing, but it's because we dream together. So even if you have a dream and you don't think you can do it by yourself, find someone else you can plant a seed with and dream with them because together the two of you guys might be able to uh, achieve that dream as well. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I want you to think about this for a second. Um, I, I just I came up with this analogy right now. So if I was to take this, this water, bo water bottle here and set it outside in the rain, would any water get into it? No. 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 So the, the cap would have to be opened in order for me to catch water into the, into the bottle. Well, just like our minds, a lot of times our, our thinking, as, as Bert was saying earlier, our thinking, it, it, it's hindering us a lot of times. Because we're, we're trying to capture an idea, but our beliefs automatically bounce that idea off of it. Right. That's right. And, and if we can take the time to listen, you know how somebody begins to talk to you and you auto automatically shake your head like you didn't already know the answer to the question before they even finish, right? Uh, the, the same thing is when you believe a certain way, if someone starts speaking to you about something and it goes contrary to your beliefs, you automatically close it off in your mind and you don't accept it, right? So if you believe you're not good enough or smart enough or have enough money or, or whatever the case may be, 
Well, guess what? You're just like that water bottle in the rain. You're not going to capture any new thoughts to persevere uh, your dream. That's right. Right? So we've got to be willing to take the cap off and, and ponder some thoughts. Let them, let them ponder for a moment in our brain before they can become subconscious later on uh, and then be a part of what we, what we do and who we are. And is that good stuff? It's good. Good analogy. It's good. So listen to this. Number three, love what you do and do what you love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> love what you do and do what you love. You know, they say the defin definition of success is doing what you love to do and getting paid for it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so maybe you're not making a, a trillion dollars, but are you successful in what you're doing? Uh, are you pursuing what you're doing? Are you loving what you do and doing what you love. It, does everybody love what they're doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's on the day. That's good, absolutely. <laughs> I love good. what I do in that statement that you have, I have in my office, by the way. It's good, Paul. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, so here it is. Uh, so what's the difference between doing something with your mind as opposed to doing something with your heart? Doing something with your mind as opposed to doing something with your heart. That's what is the one difference? One. Yeah. My head versus my heart. Okay. Lots of good notes today. Isn't the one just going through the motions and the other one is doing it with you know, with desire, with, you know, with, I would say with heart, but that would be repetitive. <laughs> Doing it with passion. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the, the, the key answer there is, are, are, do we have a passion to do what we're doing? Are we passionate about what we're doing? Or are we doing what we're doing because we think that's what we're supposed to be doing? Right. Right. And, uh, Bert said this earlier, but, you know, people ask, are leaders born? Well, yes, they are every day. That's right. Um, you know, it, it's just a matter of taking that initiative to be whoever it is that we're called to be. And, uh, you know, in the, the Bible has an illustration of David uh, when he was given armor from Saul saying, here, put this King Saul put, said, put this armor on. And David's like, this doesn't fit me. This doesn't work for me, right? So, so often we're walking in somebody else's armor. And so we need to uh, be willing to uh, um, go against the status quo sometimes and be who we were created to be, to do what we were created to do, right? Is that good stuff? Good, good stuff. Yep. Amen, brother. <laughs> Preach it. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let, let's ask this question. What are you doing now? And from that question, does it engage your heart? So I think, Tom, you cut out there just for a minute, but you said, what are you doing now? And does it engage your heart as well as your mind, right? That's correct. Okay. So who wants to jump in on that? Well, <laughs> I, I'll jump in. Um, I already revealed that I'm in law enforcement and I, you know, I do a mixed bag of things uh, in that role. Uh, as the chief, I do a lot of administrative, but I also, also uh, it's the smaller department, so I also work the road and handle the, the things that uh, we all see on TV. And um, unfortunately, they don't all get solved in 30 minutes or less. But um, <laughs> but the part of that that I love is the is the working with people, is the the actually helping people solve the problems that they have or get them on the right path to doing that. Um, what drives me further to, to further that passion and got me in, interested in the counseling is I would like to help people 
find permanent solutions to their problems and not so much the band-aids for the problem of the moment mm. um, to solve to solve the issues that created the problem they're in in the first place. Um, so that's that's what engages my my heart and my mind is is finding finding a more finding a, a way to more permanently help people with their problems. That's great. That's very good. <clears throat> so here's another question. What choices have you made based on the opinion of others, whether friends, parents, family? Do you generally make choices because it pleases others? <clears throat> Are we too busy trying to please other people? I'm not saying helping other people. Right. I'm saying please other people to the point where we're not accomplishing our dreams. I used to be. Uh, I talked about, you know, how I got into law enforcement in the first place, basically to please my father um, and win his approval. Um, I've come a long way since then. Um, I've, I, I find that's not my key motivation, although it is a part of my personality. I do tend to, to want to, to be a people pleaser. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's my current hiccup. <laughs> I think I've gotten past that part of it. Sure. sure. Anybody else want to share? I'm no expert on reading uh, facial expressions, but there were definitely some facial expressions when that question was posed. So anybody else want to share anything on that? I think when you're wisdom, when you're younger, you want to please people around you, especially your parents, right. do what you think they think you should do. But as you learn from life's experience and you gain wisdom and knowledge from yourself and life experiences, you have a tendency to understand what is important, what isn't important, and that pleasing situation changes as you grow. That's good. That's been, that's been one of my biggest things as well as, as throughout the years. But I don't know, man, you hit 50 and you just have a whole new revelation about <laughs> life. <laughs> and you go, hey, you know what? I've done it listening to everybody else. Now it's time to really like, look into your own soul and your heart and where where does god want you to be and and when things in life changes your life i think that's when you kind of go i have to stand on my own two feet i am accountable for every action and every thought that i have yeah it's good check this out as a musician um you know i play keyboard okay so in 2016 i went to africa i'm in the bush of the africa you know <laughs> There, there's no electricity or anything out there. Well, guess what? My ability requires electricity to do what I do. <laughs> so guess what? I have no job to play music out in the bush as a keyboardist, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it got me to thinking, am I useless out here? Mm. Oh boy. <laughs> right. And, and think about that. That's very powerful for yeah. a lot of folks who are even dealing with what's going on right now. I just read today that um, New York is a hundred percent workforce shut down. Right. So what do you do when you can't do what you do? Right. And, and so I think that uh, a lot of these things cause us to think outside the box. And instead of like Bert said, just just laying there saying, woe is me, because this may be the new norm. Who knows? We don't know. Nobody knows going beyond this. Uh, David might have a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, who knows what goes on? I mean, even for the, the church at large, I mean, I've, I've talked to three pastors this past week about Sharing, sharing with them how to get online. Uh, thankfully, it's as easy as, you know, clicking the live button on Facebook Live or something, but to do it right, you know, uh, it is, there's more to it. But so, so many people are not set up for that. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, churches that have already been streaming live, well, they're already in a good position. 
but there's a lot of folks that are against that idea. Uh, a lot of members in the church that are against that idea. Well, guess what? This is where we're at. So do you want church or no church? That's the question. And, and so what are we doing with uh, the opportunities that have come our way? So listen, because, we're, because of time, I want to go on to this next question. Number four, this is very important. Don't compare yourself or your dream to others. Don't compare yourself or your dream to others. I remember my band years ago, how I tried to compare myself with another band that was out there. And because we weren't achieving the same things that that band was achieving, I felt like our band was of no worth. And until I came into the acknowledgement that we're going to reach who we're going to reach, and we're gonna to touch who we're gonna to touch, and we're gonna make a difference in the lives of those who are going to make a life in, in, the, in those. So uh, when I started thinking that way, it changed my whole outlook on the thing. If I reach one person, if I reach a dozen people or a thousand people, uh, if I make a difference in their lives, then my, my mission is accomplished. You know, my dad, as a pastor, um, he, he gave his blood, sweat, and tears to ministry. Um, but he said towards the end of his life, there was one person on this planet that he felt like he was put on this earth to make a difference in. And so it may be that one person that we're mentoring, that one person who's watching us right now and watching our actions and reactions to what's going on around us and saying, you know what, I want to be like him or her and, and have that kind of resilience as well. And if we made a difference then, and we may not ever know that, but if we can just be willing to, to step out of our comfort zone and do whatever it is that we feel inspired to do. But again, don't compare yourself to others. Never compare yourself or your dreams to others. So let me ask this question. What happens when you compare yourself to those who are superior to you? Well, you're making an assumption when you do that anyway. You're, you're seeing whether they're superior or inferior to you, you're making an assumption. <laughs> value judgment and you're automatically placing yourself you're telling yourself that you're not capable or you're less than or inferior to you're discouraging yourself um, but you're only seeing a part of that person you're only seeing a side that they're representing so that's why, that's why I say you're making an assumption that you're actually superior or inferior to that person anyway because um, you really don't know them and it doesn't matter what matters is, is you and your, your, your belief in yourself and your abilities and what God's called you to do. Right on. Right on. I, I, Simon Sinek, I'm reading a book by him, and uh, he said this, uh, that he had a guy he hated. He said he hated him because he was getting more um, book sales than he was. And, and he had all this animosity towards this other gentleman. And then he, uh, someone, a promoter, had the both of them speaking at the same on the same stage, and, they, and this promoter wanted each of them to introduce one another. And when they got up to introduce themselves and shared how, uh, how they felt about the other person, if it was funny because they felt the same way about one another and they were jealous of each other, but because they were jealous of the strengths of the other person. So one had the strengths that the other didn't have and vice versa. And so we think that because a person is excelling in a certain area, they got all their junk together. Well, that's not true. That's not true. We all need each other. We're all part of a bigger body, right? And, uh, you know, right now, you know, Bert just put, you know, probably 40 people to work with this mask uh, situation. Um, 40 people now are, are scrambling around, maybe being inspired now to do something even beyond making a mask. 
Yeah. But uh, if they compare themselves to the mask manufacturers, well, they're not going to make a single mask. But if they can do what they can do, if they can make a difference where they're at. Man, it's good. It's going to change things. Oh. All right, so let, let me ask another question because I want Bert to go into the next session in just a second here. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, number five, believe in your vision for the future, even when others don't understand you. Number five, believe in your vision for the future, even when others don't understand you. Um, you know, Keith, you were mentioning earlier about you kind of, uh, foreseeing the future when it comes to communications. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you s charted a course in that direction when other people might have thought, well, man, you're wasting your time, right? Yeah. I, I had that specifically happen. There was a company I bought out uh, when VoIP was starting, and he was an older guy. And I says, Gil, you've got to get on this VoIP bandwagon. It's, it's the way of the future. And he didn't want to do it, so he sold me his company, and I just took his customers over to the VoIP side. It was you got to see, try and foresee what's going on. That's right. Be one step ahead of everybody. That's a great success story for you too, though, Keith. Right? I mean, it was unfortunate for him, but it was great for you. Yeah. Yeah. And Eleanor Roosevelt, she's uh, <clears throat> has a famous quote. She says, "The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams." And uh, you need to have a dream and you have, to, you have to really allow that dream to unfold before you, right? If you can believe in your own dreams and the beauty of it, man, you can, ach you can achieve and accomplish anything. But you have to have your own dream. It can't be somebody else's dream. It can't be your parents' dream. It can't be the dreams of your kids. It's what do you want to do? The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And sometimes it may just be, asking for clarity, asking others for help, praying, God, show me what your will is in this dream. Show me what you want me to do. And he'll begin to give you that and then planting those dreams. Guys, it is 1130. Um, Tom, are you okay if I just promote next week real quick as I go with you? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I did post a link on the comment section. Obviously, we had seven people on here today, which is great. And I know we had a lot more that were interested, but I think this is a great way to spend an hour and a half on a Saturday, especially right now since we're all kind of stuck at home anyways. So I would encourage you guys to share that link with other people. Um, it, I think we're going to try to see, we recorded this, which I thought there was some really good stuff in this session today. Um, so Tom, if, if we're able to somehow save this as a video link, we could put it up on our website. We could, we could preview that for other folks to see it. And then we can encourage more folks to join us next Saturday. Again, same thing. We'll get on at about, you know, about, about 950 uh, 955, bring your coffee and your donuts so we can all get jealous of what each other's eating. And uh, we're going to do chapter two next week, which is talking about giving clarity to your dream. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, if this continues to go well and people are coming, I know we're doing three, but uh, we may just, we may just keep working through the book and we'll see. And maybe Tom and I can rotate this, but I really enjoyed today. I hope you guys enjoyed this too. And I think it's a, it's a good investment in ourselves uh, and really our dreams by, by having these conversations. So we hope this was beneficial to you guys as well. Thanks a lot. This was good. Yeah, thank you guys. Really appreciated it. Awesome. Sounds good. So we will see you guys next Saturday. Uh, again, share it on Facebook, share the link. And if we get this uh, recording available to, to share to the public, we'll let you know how we do that. But uh, you've already been invited once. Again, you can, uh, the same link I believe will work next week as well. Um, but uh, we will see you guys next Saturday at 10 a.m. Hey, thanks, thanks guys. Thanks guys. Have a great day. Too. Bye. Bye. Bye.